Get Rich Education is brought to you by Narada Real Estate Corporate Direct and Ridge Lending Group. Cashflow real estate investors, this is Get Rich Education's Keith Weinhold. Did you know that you can finance up to 35 income properties all with one lender? Ridge Lending Group specializes in investment property loans, and they do it in almost every U.S. state. Ridge has worked with tens of thousands of real estate investors and homeowners all over the country. They've been doing this for investors for so long that at this point, they've helped more families realize their dreams of becoming real estate investors than any other mortgage lender in the country. To find out more, visit RidgeLendingGroup.com. Welcome to Get Rich Education with Keith Weinhold giving you information and ideas on the investment that has turned more ordinary people into millionaires and billionaires than anything else and can provide you with more wealth and happiness than you ever thought possible. Now, here's your host, investor, entrepreneur, business owner, and educator, Keith Weinhold. Welcome to Get Rich Education. You are inside GRE episode 102. I'm your host, Keith Weinhold, from St. Petersburg, Russia, to St. Petersburg, Florida, and across 168 nations worldwide. Thanks for being here. We're going to talk with a successful real estate investor today, Ben Leibovich. He's someone that's going to bring us sort of a different perspective and do it probably in a curb one's enthusiasm sort of way. Things aren't always sunny and great in real estate investing. It's probably just better than anything else. But you need to run a counterpoint to yourself sometimes. And that's one reason I sought out today's guest for you. And he's got a heck of a story too. Growing up in Russia in hardship and then moving to the United States, he was later diagnosed with a pretty scary disease that I'm sure he'll share with you today. When you're diagnosed with a potentially debilitating disease and you don't know how you're going to be able to provide for your family, Ben recognized that there are three types of income out there in which he could provide for his family. There's earned income, there's passive income, and there's portfolio income. Passive income is that type that you don't have to work for. And he found that real estate investing is so conducive to passive income production. But along the way, Ben's been burned in real estate investing. And he'll tell you that he's been burned. And you can hear this both in his voice and with the content that he delivers. He knows that real estate works. He's stuck with it. And he's had success since. He speaks with bluntness and conviction. And there are some differences between Ben and I. For example, Ben's never hired professional management for his properties, and I'm a big believer in using professional management. GRE is a better show when I occasionally have a serious real estate investor here that does not see things the same way that I do. It's a more valuable listen for you that way when I don't pass everything exclusively through the filter that I believe in. Ben and his family recently moved from Ohio to Arizona, which is where he joins me from today. Let's meet Ben Leibovich. Well, I'd like to welcome in a special guest today because he's really become quite a great real estate investing teacher. He was born in Russia. His family arrived in the United States when he was just 13 years old. He's a multifamily investor today. He's been a longtime contributor at Bigger Pockets. Today, he runs Cashflow Freedom University. Welcome to Get Rich Education, Ben Leibovich. Thank you so much for having me. That's so good to have you here. You have such a good story. Tell us about being born in Russia, emigrating here, and what happened to you that turned you and made you come up with a compelling why that got you into passive real estate investing, of all things. Well, that's a good question. That's a long question. It's a long question, long answer. It justifies a long answer, yes. So having been born in Russia and having grew up in Russia for 12, 13 years, whatever that was, having experience standing in line for toilet papers, you know, soap, basic home necessity items, it builds some amount, as you can imagine, of perspective. I am very much a free market kind of guy. I, I've seen the other side of it, and uh, I know what it does and what it doesn't do. So you're not going to move me off that point. That's one thing. Now, when I 
was about five years old, I started playing the violin. In fact, violinist is what I am by trade. So I've been playing since the age of five. I attended the College Conservatory of Music at uh, Cincinnati, University of Cincinnati, one of the best probably, at least at the time I was there, one of the uh, top 10 schools in the U.S. for sure, possibly top five. But along the way, in my, I want to say, either the end of first year of master program or the beginning of the second, I was diagnosed with a medical condition called multiple sclerosis. I mean, I don't want to get into the graphic details, but, you know, my physiology just went nuts. I lost coordination in my limbs. You know, they couldn't figure out what it was. They thought in the beginning possibly some kind of stroke or something, but they did the MRI. And that's the part I remember quite vividly. I'm laying at the university hospital on a, you know, one of the, one of the emergency room beds. A doc approaches me. He's got these MRI pictures in his hands. He's got glasses on. He's looking down at the MRI images. And he looks up at me, and he looks down again at the images, and he looks up at me. And by then, he's next to me, and he says to me, I don't want you to freak out, but the images here are consistent with multiple sclerosis. Well, I freaked out. Mostly because I didn't know what multiple sclerosis was. So I wasn't sure like how not to freak out because I don't even know what it is I'm being told. But, you know, he explained to me that basically we don't know that much about it. We're talking about 17, 18, 19 years ago, so a long time ago. We don't know that much about it. What we can tell you is that it develops differently in different people. It progresses faster in some, slower in others. But I can tell you that eventually you're probably going to be in a wheelchair, unable to perform basic functions that require your physiology. So, you know, where do you take that? How do you take that? Where do you go from that? So the problem obviously was twofold. Set aside the scary component because it is. I mean, I know as a diagnosis, it's not as bad as it could be. But it's scary nonetheless. So, but let's set that aside and putting some rational spin on it. The disconcerting part of it was that if I can't move, I can't work. If I can't work, I can't earn. If I can't earn, what the hell do I do? Yeah, it brings up a lot of uncertainty. It brings up a lot of thoughts about your family and it asks yourself how you can be a productive person. That's exactly it. So I dealt with a bout of depression. It lasted for about a year. I came out of it. I did a lot of laps in the, uh, in the pool while thinking about it. And then I, you know, I started to study. I started to study and that are, by the way, outlined very well in Rich Dad Education and in, in Rich Dad Books. All, all of that stuff is uh, certainly very true. There are three kinds of income. It's not safe to work for money. W-2, 1099 income is taxed much too high and diversification of revenues is the absolute key in financial stability and further financial success. So this is really the period of discovery that you were coming off of. You realized you could potentially have some great limits in life and you wanted to know how to earn income if you couldn't physically work for income. That's correct. And, uh, you know, stock market, I gave that consideration. Yes, you can buy on the margin, but you can't use leverage like you can in real estate. Starting a business, I gave that consideration. I didn't have any seed money at the time, and you can't be creative, nothing down. I didn't have any good ideas. I'm not Mr. Facebook. I'm not Mr. Twitter. I'm not Mr. Anything. I didn't have any of those ideas. So I was looking for a proven mechanism that has worked for ages and ages and ages that I could, through brain power, leverage brain power, multiply brain power to get anything done. And it just happens to be real estate. Best opportunity for a regular guy. Isn't it remarkable that we have real estate, something where no formal education is needed, no particular certification is necessarily needed, and a person doesn't even need to have a certain personality or especially an outgoing personality. So, you know, it's really a question of how can you do more with less? But interestingly, there are 
a whole lot of limitations, right? Because while you don't need education, you don't necessarily need a set of knowledge. You do need perspective. And what MS did for me is it kind of figuratively put my back to the wall, which gave me a lot of perspective on life, what can be, what will be. That perspective is what drove actions. Without that perspective, what you need is a good education with a good paper to support it and a good job that comes out of it is what you need. So not many people have perspective. I mean, if you look at the amount of invested capital, the trillions across the world, only a very small percentage, an incredibly small percentage, is invested in real estate. And that's because very, very, very few people develop the perspective that you need in order to work as hard as you need to work in order to make real estate materialize. So while it's available to everybody, almost no one takes advantage of it because almost no one has perspective on it. Well, your upbringing gives you a unique perspective. When you were a child still living in Russia and you can remember waiting in line for toilet paper, and then later you're diagnosed with something that brings a great deal of uncertainty in your life. Some people can recede and a lot of people can just exercise a scarcity mentality rather than an abundant one. Sure. But the other thing that that can do for a person, and I think it's what it did for you, is it also made you very hungry. Yes. And, you know, I'll, I'll be honest. I mean, the first reaction in all of us is scarcity. I mean, it's just the way we are wired. And that has to be overcome and overpowered. And you have to really, really want to overcome it in order to overcome it. And I'm no different in that respect. I was brought up by traditionally Russian parents, you know, intelligentsia, so to speak, engineers, people that are not, they don't have necessarily an entrepreneurial bone in their body, people who are highly educated, value education highly. And scarcity is very, you know, I could relate when I was reading those books in Rich Dad series, I could relate tremendously because that's my family. The picture he's describing about his Hawaiian father, it's quintessential. I mean, it's a cliche. Those of us who grew up in those families, we know exactly what that looks like. So I have that mentality imparted in me, you know, to a huge extent. And it's a, it's a fight and a struggle to perceive world from the other point of view. But that's what you have to do in order to experience the freedom that we're all looking for. You have to see it before you can materialize it. Well, you saw it in real estate and you've become a small multifamily apartment building investor. So tell us how you manifested your hunger into action. I got in the car. I called people. I asked for money. I, I looked for property. I lost some. I bought some. I bought some that were I shouldn't have bought. I learned a whole lot. And then I bought some that were much better. Cash flow much better and value much better. It's very much school of hard knocks. You know, you just, at some point, you have to put the car in drive and hit the gas. With every acquisition, you either get the win or you get the lesson. And people get more lessons early on and more wins later on if they stick with it. And cash flow is what enables someone to be able to weather things and stick with it. Right. And, you know, a lot of the value, specifically of early acquisitions, is the mindset and the knowledge base, the intellectual worth, so to speak. Value in real estate is not simply measured in dollars. Value in real estate is measured in perspective a lot of times. And so, yeah, I wouldn't touch now the things that I did before because I'm not as hungry now as I was before. And I'm just interested in other things. My perspective has changed. But I don't regret doing anything I did, even the things that lost me money. I don't regret because uh, I needed to learn at that time. I've never hired professional management. I've tried to systematize my systems so that I wouldn't have to hire professional management. I have folks on my crew that work with me that do the job, but I, for instance, use Buildium to uh, you know create payment portal situations and online applications and things like that. There's so much technology available today 
specifically for small multifamily. I, I really don't know why it's necessary to hire, quote unquote, a management company. Now, what I did do is I've specifically tried to remove myself from physical hands-on day-to-day applications within this game. And I did that for two reasons. One was because of MS. So the question was, can this thing continue to run, support my family, if I get taken out and I can't run anymore? So that's one piece of logic. The other is simply, if I am doing this to create any kind of, I mean, I don't want to use the words freedom, because that's a cliche, but flexibility. If I am doing this to create any kind of flexibility in my life, then certainly being attached to -to day-to-day maintenance issues is not the way to accomplish that. Right. So I've tried to create a system where, you know, I don't have too many units. I don't need too many units. I have enough to accomplish what I need to accomplish. And uh, the way that I buy, the kinds of things that I buy... I pay very close attention to what management is going to look like on the thing that I bought. And if it's going to be management intensive to a point where I am not going to be able to handle it in a hands-off kind of fashion that I want, I don't buy it. I don't care what the numbers look like on the page. I just don't need the headaches. Right. Headaches often don't show up on a Microsoft Excel spreadsheet profit and loss statement. (laughs) (laughs) That's where the perspective kicks in. That's right. Well, you become a rather good teacher at teaching other than numbers, speaking of profit and loss statements, speaking of APODs and such. You know, it's so interesting. As real estate investors, I don't know if two real estate investors, Ben, have the same definition of ROI. For example, someone might ask a question, you know, what's your ROI, Ben, on that apartment building that you've owned for five years? And first of all, most people wouldn't have any idea what the answer is. And even if someone has tried to calculate the ROI, I swear they've come up with it a different way than the next person and the next person. So tell us, what's your perspective on ROI? If someone asks you, what's your return on investment on this building? What would you tell them? How would you arrive at ROI? Well, as you know, there are so many moving parts. And again, we're coming back to perspective, a.k.a. wisdom. So the way that we look at those numbers, the way we stack those numbers is a function of how far and wide we're able to visualize what the moving parts are in this cycle of ownership of this property. For me, I use the internal rate of return as the final determining metric because I think it's the most specific and allows for the most, the clearest perspective of what this investment is going to look like. Of course, a lot of people try to use capitalization rate, which is not a metric of return at all. It's a metric of market behavior. So it's totally mistakenly used and abused as a return metric. A lot of people use cash on cash return. It's got some problems. Because it's a static metric, it makes no allotment for the time value of money, for the net present value of money in terms of time, which is, you know, where the IRR comes in. So to be very precise in your projection of what this thing is worth to you over the next five or 10 years, or to have a very clear understanding of how well you did having exited the deal Of course, internal rate of return is where you want to end up. And then, of course, the modified IRR allows you to choose your own discount rate. And we're getting into high-flying math. So I don't don't know that we need to necessarily. I'm not sure for the audience if this is going to be more confusing than not. But the bottom line is, for me, the IRR makes a lot of sense. So if you want to spend a few minutes talking about the IRR, I can kind of break my perspective on it and why I think it makes more sense. Yeah, just in a real broad perspective, since, yeah, exactly, we're in an audio medium here. We don't want to get too deeply into numbers, but the internal rate of return, that confuses some people. I think they hear the word internal and they're like, there's something going on inside there internally that I can't quite see. How do you break that down for people and why is the IRR so important to you? 
Of course, there is something go. There's a lot of things going on internally. There are. So the classical definition of IRR is it is the discount rate at which net present value of future timed cash flows is equal to zero. Of course, this is just mumbo jumbo, and it means nothing to most people. And the plain English of it all would be to say something like this. The big problem with cash on cash return is that the buying power of your dollars is not the same from year to year to year. Most right. people are able to relate to it in terms of just inflation. A dollar today is worth maybe 97.5 cents tomorrow in terms of what kind of stuff it can buy. As you project that further and further and further out, that dollar's worth of return really changes what it can buy, and it changes its value to you as an investor as a result. Then you layer on top of it things like you know opportunity cost, whereby if you're investing a dollar today in XYZ deal, and tomorrow XYW deal comes along, and you don't have that dollar to invest, then there's some kind of opportunity cost that's involved would you want to discount the returns on XYZ deal for the fact that it's going to lock you out of some other opportunities that come along? So all of that kind of thinking adds up to this reality that, look, if you are investing $100,000 today, and on paper it looks like 10% cash on cash return because it's bringing back to you $10,000, well, if you project that over 10 years or seven years or five years or whatever, you know, $10,000 it throws off in year seven doesn't have nearly the buying power that 10000 it throws off in year one. So how do you account for that? And the way we account for that is with this internal rate of return, IRR function. It's not a simple function, but it's a function in your Excel program, Microsoft or whatever. Most of these programs have it as far as I know. But what it does essentially is it tracks and times all of the cash flow events. So it says, here's how much money you're investing. And here's where the cash flows are going to be in year one, quarter one, month one, week one. You can time them whichever way you want. And here's what the expenses are going to be. And this is what the exit is going to look like. And that brings me to a very interesting other point is that in order to calculate an internal rate of return, the word internal references the fact that it's a closed loop. So in other words, you are out. Your cash is out of the deal. And cash can only come out of the deal via a refinance or via liquidation. So by underwriting to IRR, I am forced to anticipate what are my cash flow going to realistically look like and why, first? And second, what is my exit going to look like? How do I get out of this deal and why? And thinking about it in these terms gives me a lot of perspective on what the entire life cycle of the investment is going to look like. When I first started, and this is one of those perspective pieces, this is one of those you learn as you go pieces. When I first started, I needed cash. I needed cash flow to be more specific because if I can't work, how do I make money? So I was zeroed in, dead center, on cash flow to the detriment of what happens to value. And unfortunately, that led me in the beginning to buy such property that didn't appreciate. I wasn't able to force the issue enough, and I bought it in a submarket where it wasn't conducive to getting out well. And unfortunately, what I learned is that you need to get out well in order for things to end well. It's a mistake to allocate all of your investment return capability in the deal strictly to cash flow. And so underwriting to IRR does exactly this. It allows me to project and to rationalize my way through the investment opportunity and to say, here's how much I think the cash flows are going to be year to year. 
I can then adjust my expenses from one year to next, adjust my income from one year to next. And then I can say, listen, I need to exit at year X, Y, Z in order to leverage the IRR, in order to get the highest IRR. Because if I hold it any longer than that, the CapEx is going to increase, a lot, a lot, a lot of whatever other functions there may be. So it allows me to really pinpoint what my strategy on the specific acquisition should be. It's a very sophisticated way of looking at it. Is it necessary? No, it's not necessary. You buy solid property in desirable location, desirable property attributes, you'll be fine. You don't need to necessarily be this high-flying math underwriter. But if you're looking at larger stuff, specifically with investor capital involved and things like that, then obviously everybody involved will want you to have a strategy will want you to underwrite the exit to know exactly how things are going to unfold. Not to say they unfold exactly as you thought, but if you're starting with a plan and you are discounting this plan to events X, Y, Z, then you certainly have a lot more chance of being able to control the life cycle. And you're a lot less likely to get an unpleasant surprise. So an investor, they might lead with their chief criterion being a cash flow, but yeah, you've got to begin with the end in mind. What is your exit strategy? I think a lot of investors, when they buy on the front end, they're not thinking that their exit can often mean 10% of the value of a property can be shaved off at sale time between agent commissions and make ready costs. Correct. That's an important part of the exit in figuring in your total rate of return or your internal rate of return. Correct. And that brings us to another interesting point is that you cannot afford, really, as far as I can tell, to be a retail investor, which is to say you cannot afford to buy anything at anywhere close to market valuation. Because if you do that, the best thing you can hope for is that your income goes up by 3%, if you're buying in a really good economically strong market and your expenses go up by 2%, which they always do historically. So that is in and of itself alone is not going to be able to generate the kind of delta that you need to make it worthwhile to put capital at risk. It's more of a gamble. So what you need, you need to buy value add assets whereby the intrinsic value of the asset is considerably higher than that which you are paying for this asset because that's what's going to generate that delta on the back end. And the other thing you mentioned that's very, very true, very true, in order to sell, you have to spend money. Yeah, every time. Every time. Anybody who's tried to exit the property, you know, if you are lucky enough that it just wipes out one year's worth of cash flow, consider yourself lucky because Every time a buyer goes in with, with inspections and everything else, the punch list, you have to spend money to exit. So you underwrite this IRR in this little house, single family, someplace you know in Ohio or Indiana or whatever. And yeah, it's nice. $3,600 of cash flow, $4,800 of cash flow. Understand, on year five, when you go to sell, you're going to spend that much to put new flooring down, to paint the thing to make sure it's in sellable condition. You're listening to Get Rich Education. Our guest is Ben Leibovich. More when we come back, I'm your host, Keith Weinhold. Garrett Sutton here, Robert Kiyosaki's asset protection attorney and the author of Loopholes of Real Estate. As an American or foreign-based investor in U.S. real estate, you know we are a litigious society. You know that you need to protect your real estate and paper asset holdings with the right mix of LLCs and corporations. My firm, Corporate Direct, not only forms these entities, but importantly, we properly maintain them too. If you fail to follow the corporate formalities, you can lose it all in an instant. Corporate Direct is your source for LLC protection and maintenance in all 50 states. Visit CorporateDirect.com or call 800-600-1760. Mention Get Rich Education for a free bonus. Switch your resident agent service to us and receive another bonus. It's all good. We look forward to assisting you at CorporateDirect.com. Are you having a hard time finding great investment properties? Unfortunately, the best deals are rarely found locally. Successful investing begins with the right properties in the right markets. 
Norada Real Estate provides everything you need to invest in the best deals across the U.S. Our simple, proven system will help you create real wealth and passive monthly cash flow. Get your free copy of the ultimate guide to passive real estate investing at noradarealestate.com slash guide. That's N-O-R-A-D-A realestate.com slash guide. This is Rich Dad Advisor, Garrett Sutton. To grow your wealth, listen to the always valuable Get Rich Education. Welcome back to Get Rich Education. There's one important thing to bring up too here while we're talking about things like the ingredients of the internal rate of return, including the time value of money. And that is as long as an investor is prudently leveraged, over time, their cash flow will increase at a rate faster than the rate of inflation. And I've actually done a video on this at our Get Rich Education YouTube channel. Right. I think I know where you're going. Yeah, because your biggest expense is that fixed interest rate debt. Right. That does not rise with inflation. So, But you do have to be, I guess, rather active and aggressive in getting cash flow increases that keep up with the rate of inflation. If you get rent increases that just keep up with the rate of inflation, your cash flow will rise over time faster than the rate of inflation. That's true, but that requires you to be in the marketplace that can support rate increases. And if you go into the Rust Belt, I can tell you that there's a lot of markets there that will not support rate increases. And that's where you run into trouble. Yeah, you're paying less for property, but you're paying less for a reason because it's not desirable. Why? Because people don't want to be there. Why? Because they'd rather be somewhere else. So that all ties in together, which makes it ever that much more important to buy below intrinsic value. Because if there's a concern in being able to push the top line, then you better be buying the delta before you get in. Because otherwise you don't have a clear exit for specifically the reason you said. And also, once you start playing on the commercial side, this idea of a fixed interest rate is not necessarily present. A few houses, single family, you can get 30-year amortized notes at 3.25%. Everything is fine and dandy. But when you are looking at bigger property, you're doing commercial notes that are often fixed for three years, maybe five years, then they adjust. You know, that's just a reality of how, how it happens. So depending on what the prime rate does, if they adjust higher, then guess what? Your debt service may be higher. Yeah, one way to potentially hedge against some of that, if one can, and again, the market is more important than the property, one can potentially hedge against that is if when they write a lease, they automatically have those escalators in there projecting rent increases over time based on what they expect the inflation rate to be, which is a total guess. And on the IRR, there is a lot of guesswork here. We just don't know what the rate of inflation is going to be over time. We just don't know if we're going to have to have a roof replaced at year six or, or what. So there sure are a lot of guesses, and that's about as good as we can do. You kind of have to do it because it's a white canvas, and you are taking a brush, and at first it's a thick brush, and you're doing broad strokes, and then you zero in. What's my NOI going to be at the exit? Why? How much am I escalating this? How much am I escalating this? I'm looking at the marketplace. What's happening there? Why? Why do I think I'll be able to do X, Y, Z? So yes, they're all guesses, but they're educated guesses, which is always better than not even trying to paint that picture, anticipate that picture. But yes, you're right. Ultimately, we're taking an awful lot of guesses with this, awful lot of guesses. Well, Ben, any other thoughts in general here on real estate investing in the year 2016? What's the landscape look like to you nationally? I don't know what the Fed is going to do. I don't know what impact it's going to have. I know a lot of people are chasing a lot of yield, as much yield as they can get. From where I stand, I don't think we're going to have a crash, anything like what we had before anytime soon. I do have to wonder sometimes how far the rents can go from here. I have to wonder sometimes how compressed the cap rates can get. They are pretty compressed already. Some people would tell you that in a lot of cases, we're underwriting property to perfection, which never happens. So 
I think there are still deals out there, but I just think you have to really, really understand how to underwrite that stuff. Yeah, I look for signs myself. You know, quality inventory is lower in a lot of markets. Sometimes I try to get a pulse of what's going on in the market, Ben, when I talk to lenders, because basically the last crash we had in 2008, and you know, that was largely due to irresponsible lending practices. Since then, the pendulum swung that has become quite tight. And I just want to see how far it swings back toward loose until I get concerned. And it hasn't gotten that far toward loose. I had a lender on the show several episodes ago, and lenders have now expanded conventionally where you can get up to 10 single family income properties for just 20% down. Prior to that, it was just six. Prior to that, it was just four. So that's just one sign that things are becoming more loose I don't see signs anywhere that things are becoming irresponsibly loose like they were 10 years ago. I agree. And we're talking about two different markets. You have residential market and you have commercial market. When I say people are chasing yields, I mean tens of millions of dollars, big apartment complexes, things of that nature, which is somewhat decoupled in some ways from the residential market. I think that residential market is going to be fine. Because for the reasons that you just said, I don't see the kind of irresponsible, you either sleep in your car or we'll give you a loan if you have a heartbeat. Right. I don't see any of that in the marketplace. So I do think we're kind of getting close to probably needing some kind of correction in single family residential. But again, I think it's going to be flatlining. If it happens, it's going to be flatlining, if anything. It's not going to be, you know, a downward spiral like what we had before. What I think you mentioned that makes a lot of sense is quality. I think right now we're not really, neither me or you are anticipating any kind of dramatic downturn, but it's tight enough to where I think it becomes important to own quality at this point. That's one thing or else be buying at such low basis to where you know you can afford to hold on forever and you'll be just fine. Buy quality, first of all. And secondly, don't be a retail investor. Don't buy at market. Buy below market. You need that flexibility of being under market in order to guarantee safety at this point in time. There's a lot of parts of the country that have seasoned already, are at the top of the bell, and maybe even on the right side of the bell as far as the real estate uh, cycle is concerned. So not everything, not every part of the country, but I would recommend to people that if you are buying, underwrite to fundamentals, understand your cash flow is going to let you live another day. If you're going to use financing, understand your cash flow is going to let you live another day. So you'll be potentially holding the property for seven, 10 years. So buy the kind of property you can live with for seven, 10 years. That's one thing. And the second thing, underwriting to fundamentals in terms of cash flow. Don't gamble. Even if you are looking for appreciation, there has to be logic behind it, and it has to be controlled by you. Forced appreciation, we call it basically in a slang which is very difficult to do in the single family space because you're very tied to your CMA, to your comparable market analysis. In commercial space, of course, people buy income and so you control the NOI. The better you do on the NOI, even if you discount your uh, capitalization rate for the exit, you can kind of get a much clearer picture of where you're going to be. So on one hand, SFRs make a lot of sense because they're more liquid, they're easier to get rid of, a kind of a good store of money. On the other hand, understand that you don't have as much control. The market basically controls everything, which is why on SFRs, it's so important to buy under market. Yeah, I'm a big advocate of direct investing. That's where one gets the best overall rate of return. If you want more control, in a sense, you can have more control when you do have that multifamily building because you can control the income that it produces, hence the valuation. You just can't do that with single family homes. Right. So if you want to be more hands off, that probably tends to more ownership of single family homes. And, you know, one other metric I look at, Ben, when we're talking about the temperature of the market is, and we know all real estate markets are local, but just on a national basis, the median home price really isn't any greater on an inflation adjusted basis than it was in 2006 before the crash. 
That's right. That's what gives you a moment of pause. And also, as far as rents are concerned, you know, there's a lot of places. That, like, for instance, I am in Arizona right now. We just relocated to Arizona. So I've been in this place for like three weeks, literally. So as I'm looking at this, and as I'm looking out the window and seeing the palm trees, and as I'm looking at the fact that I will never see a snowflake ever again or, or sleet on my car or anything like that, I look at that, and then I go back to a place like Indianapolis, Indiana, Columbus, Ohio, Cincinnati, Ohio. People are paying the same thing. So if you ask yourself a question of why Phoenix is hot, why people are willing to pay five and a half cap. That's because they're looking at these rents and going like, well, look, nationally, this still has room to run. Now, underwriting it is very tricky because what does your capitalization rate look like on the exit? If the Fed hikes the prime by a quarter or God forbid, half percent, because all of this room that you think you have to run in terms of your top line rents, that's just going to get squashed and killed at the exit by a capitalization rate that is off half a percent. So again, it's very difficult to know how to underwrite it. But intrinsically, when you look and you compare national markets, it's difficult to look at some markets like, for instance, in Arizona here or Charlotte, North Carolina or Atlanta, Georgia, with a lot of economic activity happening and people relocating to those places. You know, it's very difficult to look at those to see that property trades at really close to the same cap rate as what it does in the Rust Belt, which doesn't necessarily have the population trends, doesn't necessarily have these corporations going in. And it's very difficult to look at that and rationalize that certain places don't have a whole lot of room to grow. But at some point, on a fundamental basis, you have to get into that moment of pause. I want cash flow. I love to be in an intrinsically great marketplace with both jobs and people moving in and droves. I love that. You know, it's alive. It's a great place. But that makes it difficult to generate cash flow. So that means you're backloading a lot of your investment return. That should give somebody a moment of pause. So again, nothing has changed, Keith. You're looking for a needle in a haystack. You are looking for that off-market deal that makes a lot of sense. You're not looking to be a retail investor. There are deals always, but the deals are always hard to find because they just are. If everybody knows about them, then you're competing with everybody. So I'm never going to say there's no deals even you know, in Manhattan. You can find a deal off-market. You can get a deal. But in terms of market behavior... We're definitely at the top of that bell curve. Well, I thought it'd be great today to bring on someone who I'm going to call a healthy skeptic. I think Ben's a really good resource for conservative due diligence. Ben, how can our audience find out more about you? Well, I have a website. It's called justaskbenwhy.com, www.justaskbenwhy.com. And uh, you mentioned in the beginning, I teach people, I do, I have a little course. It's uh, quite inexpensive. But it is quite complete and gives people a really good, healthy perspective on what you can do if you specifically don't have a lot of money to start with, what you can do, how you can start. It just basically tracks what I did and the kind of the thinking and the techniques that I used. And uh, a lot of people take advantage of it, and I have a lot of positive reviews. So it's, uh, I think it's a nice asset that you don't have to spend $20,000 for. Just a few hundred bucks. Just ask BenY.com. Ben Leibovitz, thank you so much for coming on to Get Rich Education. It's my pleasure, Keith. It was fun. <laughs> yeah, I enjoyed that too, Ben. Talking with a real estate teacher that has a different approach than me and also a different way of explaining things than I do, Ben is that Bigger Pockets contributor and we've had other guests whom have come from that sphere of influence, like Seth Williams and Michael Blanc, who have each been here on GRE. Ben is not a quitter, that's for sure. He knows who he is. He's quite intentional and measured about what he does. Buy for cash flow, choose your market and your submarket even more carefully than you choose your property. When U.S. housing prices peaked 10 years ago, 
prices then were 24% higher than they are today in inflation-adjusted terms. Back then, you had a lot of irresponsible lending. Today, not so much. There's this great chart, this interactive chart. You can click on and off about 25 of the largest U.S. metros and see what both the overall U.S. market is doing performance-wise, price-wise, and how your metro market is doing. And you can toggle off any number of metros price data and overlay them accordingly. That chart will go out in our next GRE newsletter. I expect Rich Dad Advisor Tom Wheelwright to join us next week for his record fourth Get Rich Education appearance. And it's just amazing to grab Tom's energy. I'm looking forward to that. Hey, special thanks to Ben Leibovitz today. I'm your host, Keith Weinhold. Live an abundant week and don't quit your daydream. You've been listening to Get Rich Education, telling you what the wealthy won't tell you about real estate and investing. Nothing on this show should be considered specific, personal, or professional advice. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, financial, or business professional for individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own. Information is not guaranteed. All investment strategies have the potential for profit or loss. The host is operating on behalf of Get Rich Education, LLC, exclusively. Flow real estate investors nationwide and worldwide. This is Get Rich Education's Keith Weinhold. Forbes has rated Memphis, Tennessee as the number one cash flowing market in the world. Our good friends at Mid South Homebuyers have been Memphis's premier turnkey real estate provider for 14 years with a stellar reputation and an A plus rating with the Better Business Bureau. Owner Terry Kerr was born and raised in Memphis. Yeah, he knows the market and has renovated and sold over 1,000 houses in the Memphis area. Find out what their many repeat buyers already know. Their houses are completely renovated, even come with a one-year builder's warranty and a lifelong rental guarantee. They're a perfect fit for the first-time out-of-state investor or the seasoned investor diversifying their portfolio. Mid-South Homebuyers friendly staff makes investing easy. Learn more at midsouthhomebuyers.com or give them a call at 901-217-HOME. The preceding program was brought to you by your home for wealth building, getricheducation.com.